Let's go to the word of God. Let's turn to Mark chapter 15. Two weeks back, we read that long passage from Mark 15, 15 to 32, where we see Jesus going to the cross, literally being taken to the cross. You know, we see his sufferings. And um, for the last two weeks, I've been pointing out, especially two weeks back, if you heard that sermon, you should know. I tried to show you how much the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, especially the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, how much they emphasize the shame that Jesus bore on the cross, the depth of humiliation he faced is emphasized very much in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When we think of the cross, and we think of the suffering that Jesus endured, we often think in terms of pain. You know, when they flogged him, how much it would have hurt, and how it would have torn his back, and when they drove the nails into his hands and feet, how that would have felt, and the Passion of the Christ did a reasonable job at depicting that. The pain would have been horrible, it would have been extreme, excruciating as the word is used, which comes from cross itself. But you go to the Bible and you open Matthew, Mark and Luke and you read and you will see that pain is not emphasized so much. It's not emphasized so much. It's not that it's not there, it's, it's there, obvious. It's everybody who knows anything about crucifixion knows it's a painful process, it's a torture. But it's not emphasized so much. What is emphasized very much is the shame he bore, the humiliation he bore, the different ways in which he was humiliated, the extent to which he was humiliated. That is emphasized very much in the Synoptic Gospels, including Mark. And that is why I spent two weeks showing you how, to what extent he was humiliated, all the different ways he was humiliated, and the meaning of it. What is the meaning of it? He was humiliated so much he bore so much shame so that we might share in his glory. So that we might share in his glory. He shared in our shame so that we might share in his glory. He bore our shame so that we can receive the glory from him, you know. He gives us a certain honor and glory. God himself gives that. We spoke about that, right? He went so low on the cross to the depths of humiliation, you know. In, in every way, shape, or form, eh? physically, in every way, he went so low so that we can go so high. <laughs> the depths to which he went is comparable to the heights to which we can go in and through Jesus Christ. He became like us. See, he didn't bear his, it was not his shame that he bore, it was, he was bearing our shame really. He never sinned. He should have never gotten shame. I showed you last week that shame came into the world only because sin came. Only after sin, shame enters the world. Right? There was no such thing called shame before sin. And so, only sinners deserve shame. Jesus does not deserve shame, only glory. And yet he bore the shame of the sinner so that the sinner can have a share in his glory. He became like us so that we might become like him. He was our substitute bearing our shame on the cross. He took our place. This is the most important foundational meaning of the cross. What is happening there is happening in my place. Everybody say in my place. Eh? So that I can benefit from that. Eh? So I spoke, we dwelt on that for two weeks. But since I've spoken about that for two weeks, now today I feel compelled since I've talked about how Jesus bore so much shame, humiliation, today I feel compelled to talk about how Jesus shines forth gloriously on the cross. <laughs> Listen carefully. Let me put it like this. Today I feel compelled to talk about how there is a glory... <laughs> If your eyes can see it, there is a glory that is revealed as Jesus is hanging on the cross. Let me put it like this. Jesus is revealed gloriously as he is hanging on the cross. 
let me put it like this. I'm trying to tell you what we're covering today in different ways, okay? Today we're going to see how it was not a common criminal who hung on the cross, but rather a glorious king hanging on the cross. In fact, let me go one step further and say, we're going to see today how Jesus reigned from the cross. Now, you, you should listen to that statement carefully. It's a, it's a bit pushing it, you may say. Today we're going to see how Jesus, as the early Christians put it, reigned from the tree. That's how the early Christians put it. The first two, three hundred years. Great men like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus. They spoke in these terms, they said, Christ reigned from the tree. They meant the cross. Not after the cross. You know, listen carefully. Jesus reigned from the cross. While he was hanging there, he was actually ruling and reigning. That's what we're going to see today. And maybe you're thinking... You know, what is this? You're, you've totally flipped it now. Last two weeks you said Jesus bore shame and humiliation. You know, he was humiliated to such a terrible extent. Today you're saying he's ruling and reigning while hanging. What is this? Both are true. <laughs> Both are true. In fact, it was necessary to see the shame and the humiliation first because to the extent that he's being humiliated, he's actually reigning. Unless you see how far he was humiliated, you cannot grasp how much he is ruling and reigning and revealing his kingly glory on the cross. That's what we're going to talk about today. Let me clarify what we are not talking about today. We're not talking about our glory. The honor that God bestows on us. I'm not talking about that today. That's not the subject that we spoke about that last two weeks. Today, that's not the subject. Today, we're not talking about Jesus' glory before or after the cross. We're not talking about his glory before or after his death. Pay attention. Huh? So before he died on the cross, before he's suffering like this, we saw his glory, right? When he calmed the sea, when he walked on the sea, when he healed the sick, when he raised the dead, when he drove the demons out, he's revealing his glory. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're not talking about that glory. We're not talking about the glory of Jesus at the resurrection and beyond. When he rises from the dead and he's exalted to the Father's right hand and he rules and reigns, there is a great glory there. It's obvious to see. We're not talking about that. I'm talking specifically about the glory of the crucified Jesus. While he's hanging there, he's glorious. He's a king who rules and reigns while he's hanging there. He reigned before that and after that also, but while he's hanging on the cross also, he rules and reigns. That's what we're going to see today, okay? Now, why am I talking about this? Well, let me give you some reasons. Why am I talking about this and why is it relevant to you? Why should you listen to a sermon like this? Okay? And not just because it's interesting, but it's because it's scriptural teaching. It is scriptural teaching. It's a quite interesting notion, isn't it? To think that he could be reigning from the cross while hanging on the cross. <laughs> I'm not saying after he rose again. No, no, while hanging on the cross. It's very interesting, but I'm not teaching it because it's interesting. It is scriptural. It's a scriptural teaching. Eh? So that's why you need to hear it. But you may say, well, how is it relevant to me? You know what? Okay, it sounds interesting, an interesting idea, but what good is it to me? What, what use is it for me in today's world? Well, I'll tell you what use it is. If you can see this, if you can see this sight that behind the shame there is a glory for those who have eyes to see, if you can see the cross in the right way, you will see the whole world differently. You will see everything differently. I'm telling you, I'll try to show you this today. I can't guarantee everyone will get it. This is a truth that is, it just boggles the mind. I pray you get it by the help of the Holy Spirit. But if you get it, if you get it, if you pay attention, if the Holy Spirit helps you, and if you think through this, and if you're able to see that glory that, that I'm talking about, Jesus reigning from the cross, you will begin to see everything else differently. It'll change your perspective about everything else. Why else is it relevant to you? Because this sight, if you can see what I'm talking about, it will satisfy you. It will satisfy you. If you're thinking, why should I hear this sermon? Well, this is what your heart is longing for. Your, your heart may not even know it, but 
I know what your heart is longing for. Because I know what every human heart is longing for. You know what it's longing for? It's longing to see glory. It's longing to see something beautiful. <laughs> That's why you see people with a lot of time and money, they will catch a flight, go to the other end of the world and just, you know, stare at the beautiful sights of nature. And they'll just bask in it and enjoy it and uh, that's what brings fulfillment to them. People, you know, who are not able to travel like that, you say, stay put, don't see anything, they won't listen to you. If you give man a good house, a good salary, good work, good family, everything he needs and say, stay put in your house, just, just be quiet, he won't be quiet. He'll say, no, I want to go see something. It's not enough for man's needs to be met. His heart longs to see something beautiful. And that's why those without time and money, they pull out their phone, you know. They want to see something beautiful in their phone. Something attractive. Something that is, uh, you know, arrests their attention. Something, something, you know, different people look for different things. They're attracted to different things. Some people to sights in nature. Some people to wrong kind of stuff. They just want something for their heart to be satisfied with. (laughs) You know why? God has put that desire inside every single human. The yearning to see something great. It has been put by God, but now it is twisted by the devil. (laughs) You know why God put that yearning inside of you? You will never be satisfied until you see something great. It's not enough to have food on the table, not enough to have a good job, not enough to go and have come and have a good... No, 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 not enough. You need to see something great. (laughs) You know why God put it? Because he wants to satisfy that desire by revealing his glory. The only thing that will satisfy that longing of the human heart is a sight of the glory of... God. Now, where can you see the glory of God? You can see it in creation. Yes, you can. But better than that, you can see it in Scripture. In Scripture, where do you see it best? In Christ. And in Christ, where do you see it best? On the cross. Okay? That's why I want to show this to you. And I believe that not only will it satisfy you, it will transform you. Enough reasons why you need to hear this. You know, let me lay out the plan for today. First, I'll show you that scripture teaches this truth. Mark teaches it in other places also it it starts. Secondly, I'll show you that some others have seen it. Some others have seen it. Not everybody has seen it. Not everybody can see it. But some have seen that Jesus has some kind of glory while he's hanging on the cross and he's actually ruling and reigning while on the cross. You know, Some have seen it. And thirdly, I want to help you to see it. If you will think with me, with the help of the Holy Spirit, if we will think, meditate in a biblical way, theological way, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can see it. And then I want to end with some application. First, this is taught in scripture. This is not my idea. This is not some interesting, fancy notion. No, it is taught in scripture. It's taught in Mark itself. It's taught in Mark chapter 15. It is taught in a hidden way and in a more obvious way. It's, it's taught in a sort of indirect way as well as in a direct way. Okay? Now, let me first show you the indirect way. The indirect way is that it is taught through dramatic irony. Dramatic irony. It is suggested, let me say, it is suggested through dramatic irony. You know, dramatic irony is when the characters in the story don't know what the audience knows. The characters in the story don't know what the audience knows. It's like, you know, it, it happens with the reading a story or watching a movie. You know, you can, you know that's the villain, but they don't know. And they're trusting him and you feel like telling, oh, no, no, don't trust that fellow, you know. Or you know he's a good guy and they're suspecting him and you feel like telling, you know what I mean? Like you know more than the characters in the story, right? Dramatic irony is used by writers and so on. But irony is something that also happens in real life. <laughs> It's a phenomenon that actually happens in real life. 
So what's happening here is, you know, just because I'm saying dramatic irony and story and using all these words, don't think that this is all made up and this is a, you know, a nice piece of literature that some writer wrote with irony. No, 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 this actually happened, okay, this actually happened. But the way it happened and the way it was recorded and faithfully preserved for us suggests that we need to think about some things. What happened here? What happened is, when Jesus is being taken to the cross, again and again he is mocked as what? The king of the Jews. Six times from verse 2 up to verse 32, if you look in Mark 15, he is mocked as the king of the Jews. He is referred to as the king of the Jews. Eh? Let me just give you the verses. Okay? Six times you see this title, the king of the Jews. Eh? Verse 2 has it, verse 9, verse 12, verse 18, verse 26, verse 32, okay, six times out of the six, five say king of the Jews and the last one, verse 32 says the king of Israel, which is the same thing, okay. So here is a title that is repeated six times in just half a chapter, so which means you can't miss it, okay. Every time it is used, it is used to mock Jesus. Three times Pilate says it in mockery basically. One time the Roman soldiers are mocking him. You know when they put the crown of thorns on his head and the purple robe and then bow before him saying, Hail King, you know, and strike him with the thing, you know. One time it is that uh, wording on, the, on top of the cross as Jesus is hanging there, probably naked, humiliated, on top of his head is an inscription with the charge against him and it reads, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews and it says it in three languages. It was, why was it put there? They did not intend to honor Jesus, they intended to mock him as the king of the Jews. They said, it was an announcement to everybody, look what happens if you claim to be king, you know. And then the last time in verse 32, the chief priest, the Jewish religious leaders are mocking him, saying, oh, let the king of Israel come down and we'll believe him. Let him come down from the cross. So every time they're mocking him with that title, but because Mark faithfully records it and has it, as we read the text, as it repeats again and again and again, it, it, it catches our attention. Repetition leads to us catching it. And therefore, Mark, I'm, I'm saying that not only me, but several scholars have suggested that what Mark is doing is, is forcing us to think about that title. What title? The king of the Jews. They are mocking him as king, but the audience knows he is really king. They are mocking him as king, but the audience knows he is. Mark knows he is really king. Mark's original audience knows he is really king. Mark's original audience probably, you know, Gentile Christians in Rome, they say, they know he's king. <laughs> we, you're reading it today, you know he's king. As every time they're mocking him, you feel like he is king. You fellows, you <laughs> feel, like, feel like stopping them saying, he is king, man. He, he's just a different king from what you're used to. He's, in fact, he's not just the king of the Jews. He's the king of the whole world. He's the king of kings. Don't you feel like saying that? So the experience of the reader reading the text, even though the fellows in the actual incident are mocking Jesus, you are forced to think about that title, King, 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 right? Irony. <laughs> and through that, they say that Mark is forcing the reader to think, look what's happening to the king. Look what's happening to the king. Look what's happening to the king. He's being humiliated. And then you come up from one step from that. The one who's hanging on the cross. As he's hanging, the title is above him. And that tells you, well, the one hanging there is the king. Yeah, they're mocking him. But you know, he is king. He is king of the whole world and he's hanging there. Yeah. The one who hangs is a glorious king. Come up one step from that. It's not too much to say the king is reigning. Ruling. Maybe it is too much for you, for your years now, I'll explain it. Eh? But this thing of uh, irony is used. And uh, let me just say as a, an aside, 
there are titles like this used in history that were originally intended as mockery like for example they say abraham lincoln was called the great emancipator before he emancipated liberated the slaves he was mocked as the great emancipator as though he's going to be able to liberate everyone you know i don't know some people say that the title probably originated that way of referring to him it was probably intended as mockery even the title the father of the nation that we use for mahatma gandhi gandhi ji they say the title originated some years before the independence when india did not get its independence and some actually use the title to mock him saying father of the nation as though his methods is ever going to free the nation father of the nation you know well turned out his methods were instrumental in freeing the nation and he now today these people whether it's lincoln or gandhi ji proudly you know are referred to as uh, by these names right i'll give you another example with jesus itself you know they mocked jesus you've heard of the title the friend of tax collectors and sinners right have you heard of that jesus is referred to in the bible as the friend of tax collectors and sinners did you know that was actually intended as mockery go read the passage they were mocking jesus but actually it's true the friend of he is the friend of it's like that they're mocking him as king of the jews king of the jews king of the jews but he's actually the king of the jews and he's in fact more he's king of the whole world no king like him mark is suggesting to the reader come on come on think so those are you may say well i don't know about that you know you preacher you see something in everything you know well for those let me show the direct evidence <laughs> this is the indirect way it's pretty strong most scholars would say it's a big deal mark 1539 is the direct way now it is not indirect now there is no mockery jesus has suffered and died 37 says he breathed his last he uttered a loud cry breathed this last 38 says the temple veil was torn in to something great happened in the temple immediately after he died and then 39 now that's what i want you to read when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed this last he said truly this man was the son of god now think carefully don't just pass over that verse verse 39 the centurion is the guy who's supervising the whole thing he's the guy who's been supervising jesus is flogging probably Jesus is walk to Golgotha Jesus is crucifixion he's been supervising everything probably he even might have participated in the mockery at least he would have stood and watched by and supervised the mockery of Jesus he's the main guy in charge he's right at the foot of the cross but something happened so that now when he saw look at verse 39 he saw that in this way he breathed his last when when he saw the way jesus died by the time jesus died something happened so that this roman centurion opens his mouth and says truly this man was the son of god now this is not mockery this is a statement he really feels that way truly this man was the son of god the mockery is long past gone you know it ends in verse 32 kind of there's a big separation between this section and that you know here this man has now changed his mind about jesus he probably thought in the beginning what kind of king is he you know being beaten flogged humiliated like this what kind of king is this but then something must have happened by the time jesus dies the man thinks he's the son of god you know what he's saying at a minimum he's saying truly this man is some kind of king <laughs> truly this man is some kind of king I don't think by son of god he meant what we mean you know we know better what son of god means than the roman centurion what does son of god mean son of god means the second person of the trinity jesus is the second person of the trinity jesus is the word in the beginning made flesh 2000 years ago jesus is this matchless one right he's god himself i don't think the roman centurion knew all that you know maybe slightly towards that but they say what he must have meant at a minimum what would he have meant at a minimum with what meaning did he say truly this man was the son of god well the romans they referred to only one person as the son of god who the emperor and usually the great ones no other human was referred like that you know 
it is only the gods you know the deities or among humans only the emperor was referred to with that title on the coin for example you'd have the emperor's imprint or the image then would be written son of god and so on so here's a roman centurion who in his culture and in his world only the king could be the son of god you know if ever there was a son of god but then something about jesus convinces him that truly this man was the son of god meaning truly he's some kind of king he's some kind of, how did he change his mind if you ask me how he changed his mind i would say that just the way jesus endured that suffering and death would have changed his mind i mean this guy roman centurion would have put many people to death the romans killed thousands upon thousands crucified them so this guy probably you know has put crucified many people and he's seen many watched many people die many jewish martyrs die many jewish insurrectionists die those jews who went against the roman empire were caught and then convicted and crucified he would have seen many and you know if you read the sources during jesus time or even before that you will see that some of the jewish martyrs when they die you know they curse out their enemies <laughs> they say my god will never leave you alone you will burn you know you will you will face the judgment for all this <laughs> that's how they died jesus on the other hand <laughs> very different he's forgiving his enemies saying father forgive them for they know not what they do forgiving the guys who are driving the nails into his hands forgiving the guys who flogged him they are mocking him but he's not saying anything in return instead he's only uttering words of forgiveness and love i think when the centurion saw all that and then 3 hours there was darkness over the land complete darkness imagine the centurion watching all that 3 hours signs in the heavens darkness and then jesus cries out saying my god my god why have you forsaken me and then he cries out saying it is finished and into your hand i commit my spirit all this just changed his mind he must have thought something is different god must have opened his eyes to see glory in the crucified one can you see that jesus is hanging there to most eyes he looks like he's hanging in shame but to the centurion now he looks like he's the son of god truly this man was the son of god not everybody can see it but he can see it so what i'm saying to you is at least one person <laughs> has seen that while hanging on the cross not after the resurrection not clothed in beauty and splendor no while hanging in utter humiliation on the cross that man sees not humiliation but glory the centurion sees that this is the son of god so that is how it is directly taught in mark itself okay now in john for example it is taught more clearly in mark is a little subtle about this but in john for example this idea that jesus has a certain glory on the cross itself jesus is sort of uh, you know being glorified not just being humiliated but being glorified on the cross itself listen to this jesus is not just being humiliated but glorified on the cross itself this idea is taught clearly in john for example three times in the gospel of john jesus talks about himself as being lifted up it's familiar verses you know john 3 14 and 15 as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up what does he mean he's clearly referring to the cross right now the word lifted up means it's a double meaning they actually put the person nailed him to the cross and then lifted up the beam there was a literal lifting up <laughs> okay they lifted the victim up like that so that the world can see because they wanted to shame the person being crucified the romans that was the design right that was the purpose of lifting up but in the gospel of john there is a double meaning while he is being lifted up like this with the intention of being shamed actually simultaneously he is being glorified <laughs> simultaneously he is being romans are lifting him up to shame him but that's when he is actually being glorified more that's the idea eh? john 12 32 33 for example and i if i be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me 
Right? Have you seen that verse? Very famous verse, right? John 12, 32. If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And so immediately when you look at that, you think, oh, maybe he's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about the ascension. He's talking about the exaltation. When I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw everyone to me. Or maybe he's talking about us lifting up in worship, you know. Read the next verse. What is it talking about? This he said signifying what death he should die. It is first of all talking about the cross being lifted up on the cross. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. It's in the lifting up. Something is going to happen. Eh? So Jesus himself thinks of his own uh, crucifixion, his own literal lifting up, as also a lifting up in glory, you know, as a sort of the glorification is beginning, you know. Or look at John 17, 1. Eh? John 17, 1. This is a big theme in John. I don't have the time to show it in detail, but John 17, 1. This is the last prayer of Jesus before he goes to the cross, you know. Next chapter is Gethsemane. This is the great high priestly prayer of Jesus before the cross. And look at verse 1 and 2. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. Father, the hour has come. In the Gospel of John, when you see the words, the hour has come, the hour has not come, the hour has come, it is referring to the hour of his death and resurrection. And, and very emphatically, his death, the hour of his sufferings. That's what it really means if you trace it out and go and study it. Father, the hour has come, the time has come to die, but then look at what Jesus says, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. He's saying the hour has come to die. Time for you to glorify me, Lord. <laughs> He's not looking past the cross to the resurrection and beyond alone. No, no, that's not the correct way to look at it. He's looking at the cross and beyond. Glorify me in and through the cross and the resurrection and everything that is to follow. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Verse 2 indicates that cross also is in view. Anyway, so throughout the Bible, there is this idea that there's something glorious about the cross, isn't there? Like when Paul uh, insists that as Christian preaching is nothing but preaching Christ crucified. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 24, right? Huh? He says the Jews seek after a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. You know, do you know what a big deal it is to say that in the first century? In a world ruled by the Romans, in a world where crucifixion was an everyday reality, in a world where the Romans said, don't even say the word cross publicly. Don't even bring it in conversation. It's most indecent, shameful word. That's what Cicero, the great Roman statesman said. Don't even say the word. Don't make me think that. It is so indecent and shameful. That's how they thought. In that world, you know how, what an incredible thing it is for Paul to say, we preach Christ crucified. Which is foolishness to the Greeks. Which looks like weakness to the Jews. But that's what we preach. Christ crucified. The cross is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Or take Paul saying in another place, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That means there is, yeah, some people are ashamed because it involves the cross, but I am not ashamed. Or take the other place where Paul says positively, Galatians 6, I will boast in nothing else except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What? Why? Why not boast in the resurrection? <laughs> you know, there's something where some people got a revelation of the cross where that's the main thing they're promoting, you know. And that's why the early Christians, I'm talking two, three hundred years, you know. People like, I mentioned Justin Martyr, all those kind of people, right? They said uh, things like, the Lord has reigned from the tree. <laughs> what a statement. The Lord has reigned from the tree. Or uh, we see God ruling the nations from a tree. What? We see God ruling the nations from a tree? <laughs> it's incredible. Huh? Start in the Bible. Some people saw it. 
I'll give you another example of, you know, I'm combining my scriptural teaching and some people saw it, right? Yeah? I've shown you Mark taught it, Paul taught it, John taught it. And who saw it so far? We've seen the centurion saw this. He saw Jesus having some glory. That's why he said, truly, this man is the son of God. One other person we know surely saw it when Jesus was hanging on the cross. During those moments, who was that? The thief on the cross, right? We call him the thief on the cross, but he was far more than a thief. He must have been a bad criminal, you know. They wouldn't just put a thief on the cross. You know what I mean? He must have been an insurrectionist or some kind of a rebel terrorist. That's what he must have been. So anyway, let's call him the thief on the cross itself. But there were two thieves on the cross. And um, one of them, we know, was good and one of them was bad. And since one mocked Jesus and the other did not. But actually, if you read the Gospels carefully, it appears as though in the beginning, both of them mocked Jesus. You can read for yourself, Mark 15, 32, Mark 27, 44. In the beginning, both of them appear to have mocked Jesus. And then something must have happened, it looks like, because Luke tells us one of them not only stopped mocking Jesus, he actually believed Jesus fully. How do we know that? We know it by the statement he made. Huh? Let's go to Luke 23. You will see the two thieves, you know, uh, conversing between themselves. While the one guy mocks Jesus, the other guy says, no, don't mock him, stop it. You know, Luke 23, 41, this good guy says, at least we are suffering for what we did. He has not done anything wrong. Somehow he's come to the conclusion now that Jesus has done nothing wrong. He's absolutely innocent. And then in verse 42, he makes an astounding statement. The thief on the cross says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Some translation says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Whether or not he said Lord, he at least said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Everybody say your kingdom. Just picture this. This is a guy who's hanging beside Jesus on the cross. And he is referring to the one next to him saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That means somehow this guy sees this man as a king with a kingdom. And no matter what happens now, his story is not over. He's going to come back powerfully with a kingdom. And uh, I better be on his side that time. That's how this guy is thinking. He says, you know, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How in the world did he conclude that the one hanging next to him, probably beaten more than him, probably shamed more than him, is actually a king with a kingdom and is going to come and manifest that kingdom. My goodness. His eyes have been opened. <laughs> Amazing confession. And Jesus responds to that faith. That request and he says, today you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> At least two people saw it. Centurion saw it. Thief on the cross saw it. <laughs> again, if you say, how, why, how, you know, I would say, again, the way Jesus suffered. Everything would have played on his mind. He would have thought and he would have, I don't know, other things could have been involved, you know. Certainly, the Holy Spirit opening and revealing the truth to this guy. And he sees all of a sudden, not a man hanging in shame, but a glorious king who's going to soon come into his kingdom. So, scripture teaches it. Some people have seen it. Two people saw it while Jesus was hanging on the cross. Christians have seen it throughout history. What about you? You know, Christians throughout history, they, they make statements like, oh, he reigns from the tree. The cross is the throne. Have you heard that? Paradoxical statements. How can the cross be a throne? I'll show you. Well, let's try to see now with the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's think, meditate biblically with the help of the Holy Spirit. What we are saying is, Jesus is king on the cross itself. The one dying there is a glorious king. Not only that, while he is hanging on the cross, he is ruling and reigning. That's what I'm saying to you. While he is hanging on the cross, he is ruling and reigning. He is reigning from the tree. He ruled, reigned from the cross, while on the cross. Do you, are you able to accept that statement? The reason we find it hard to accept that statement is 
our idea of ruling is already preset. We have a certain idea of ruling, reigning in our mind. When I say Jesus reigned from the tree, it sounds, uh, what? <laughs> How? <laughs> the reason maybe you're not, we're not able to accept that easily is because in our minds, ruling and reigning means something else. What does it mean? We have a certain picture of ruling and reigning. We picture ruling and reigning as a king sitting on a big golden throne, you know, in uh, glorious uh, kind of robes and uh, with a crown on his head and giving, issuing orders left and right and being served by so many servants and displaying his wealth and honor and greatness in an obvious way. That is what ruling and reigning brings to mind for us, right? Where did we get that idea of ruling and reigning from? We got it from the world. Because those in authority, position, power and so on you know, seem to be like that, you know. They seem to be people who are giving out orders and being served by many others and uh, they seem to display their wealth and this and that in an open and uh, flagrant way and all that. So we get the idea of ruling from the world. But let me say that uh, you should not understand the cross in light of the world. You should understand the world in light of the cross. You'll understand what that means later. See, don't try to understand the cross in light of the world, in light of, in light of worldly notions of ruling. You will not. Instead, if you paid attention to Jesus' teaching and then look at the cross, you will understand. Because remember, Jesus taught us even before this what ruling and reigning really means. In the kingdom, how ruling and reigning is different how power and glory is different in the kingdom. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. Jesus has already taught us this, but it's been such a long time that we should you know, remind ourselves, if this has seeped into your system, <laughs> this way of thinking, I'll show you what way of thinking. And then you look at the cross, then you will understand how Jesus is ruling from the cross while hanging on the cross. What is ruling and reigning about? Is it about issuing orders and displaying your great wealth and your pomp and your, you know, being served by many others? Is that what ruling and reigning is about? No, Jesus, you know, in Mark 10, 42, you remember the context here? The disciples are arguing amongst one another saying, oh, who is the greatest, you know? <laughs> James and John, remember, they're arguing. And so Jesus calls them in verse 42 and he says, Mark 10, 42, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. So rulers of the Gentiles, meaning in the world, those who are considered rulers, how do they rule? They lord it over the people below them. They exercise, they show their authority. You know, They show that they're the boss, so to speak. Verse 43, but it shall not be so among you. Jesus is saying, you should not be like that. I know the world is like that, but you should not be. My disciples, my followers, my believers should not be like that. Verse 43, let me continue. But whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. You want to be great? Be a servant. So the ones in the world, those who want to be great, they're looking up you know, above them to see who can I pull down, how can I plot and bring this fellow above me down so that I can climb up to the top. Jesus is saying, you want to be great? Don't look at the fellows above you, look at the fellows below you and become their servant. Become their don't even look at the fellows below you and rule over them. No, no, become their servant. Then it gets worse or better, whichever your perspective is. Verse 44. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. So he's saying, you want to be great? Become people's servant. You want to be number one? I want to be number one. You want to be number one? You become slave of all. <laughs> Sounds totally upside down. He turns the logic of the world upside down. Or maybe right side up. Because <laughs> his logic is the right logic. He's saying ruling and reigning is not lording over people, showing authority, 
and just having you know a lot of servants and you know showing the world in a bombastic kind of manner no that's not what ruling and reigning is about that's not what greatness is about greatness in the kingdom is about serving others and the higher you want to go the lower you go and serve <laughs> you want to become number one become everyone's slave meaning serve them everybody say serve them that's the point and then he clarifies it giving himself as an example verse 45 for even the son of man is saying myself he's referring to himself for even the son of man came not to be served but to serve everybody say not to be served but to serve <laughs> it's the greatest one who has come down from heaven why did he come not to be served usually we think greatness is measured by how many people are serving you no 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 in the kingdom it's measured by how many you are serving <laughs> jesus says I, i didn't come to come here and relax on an easy chair while all of you come and you know serve me as my servants first of all god doesn't absolutely need our service you think god is sitting up there saying oh i wonder if my people are going to serve me cooperate like the troubled bosses in our companies you know thinking oh i wonder whether these fellows will do what we say you know no 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 god doesn't need anybody's service if he uses our service if he uses us to serve him it is pure grace it is pure grace be thankful praise him but don't ever come to the conclusion oh without him he'll be in trouble no 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 he's going to be fine he came from there to here to serve us because without his service we would be lost we would be done what kind of service did he come to offer came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for that's the service he came to serve us what service to give his life as a ransom for many meaning salvation is the service he offers <laughs> salvation is the service he offers you got you know you want food you go to a hotel they'll serve you you want uh, you know medical treatment go to a hospital they'll serve you doctors are servants in that sense they serve people they act for the well being of others or they should you know teachers all of these are roles of service you know and every role has its own honor you know from the doctor to the one collecting the trash every job is an honorable job every service is honorable you know sometimes people look down on certain things but let all the people collecting trash suspend their activities for one month then let's see what happens right <laughs> then we'll know how oh, their service also is very valuable so every service is valuable and you got service for all kinds of things in the world but one thing nobody ever nobody can ever serve you is salvation from sin <laughs> nobody can ever offer that service jesus is the only one who can save us from sin in the world they'll give you this that and everything but the root of all problems is sin and jesus came to offer us salvation redemption redemption from that sin how does he do that he gives his life as a ransom for many so listen jesus defined what it means to rule It is not the world who defines what it means to rule Jesus defines what it means to rule to rule means to serve to rule means to to reign means to <laughs> so greatness is connected with service <laughs> not with the uh, you know bombastic displays of power or wealth or something like that and so if you look at the cross with the lens of mark 10 you put on this lens don't think like the world <laughs> don't say oh you know how could he be ruling from the cross put on this kind of lens and look at the cross what you see on the cross is while jesus is hanging there on one level it looks like hot utter humiliation it looks like he's utterly helpless but you know what he's doing there is the greatest service to mankind as he seems to hang there helplessly he is bearing my sin he is bearing my curse he is bearing my shame he is taking it all he is paying the price for my sins so that he can ransom me out 
he can redeem me from sin and from curse and from shame and all these things he can redeem me what is happening is the process of redemption is happening what is happening on the cross as jesus hangs there is he is doing his greatest work he's in the middle of work man he's in the middle of very great work is happening whether your eyes can see it or not it's happening some can't see it some can see it he knows it how is he reigning from the cross he is reigning by serving he is doing more service than he ever did before more than when he served the 5000 with loaves and fishes that was nothing compared to this service here he is purchasing redemption for the whole world <laughs> paying for the sins of the whole world paving the way for anyone to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light that's what he's doing while it looks like he's hanging there in shame in in weakness in helplessness he is performing the greatest service <laughs> if your eyes can see it he is ruling while hanging because he is serving can you see it you need a fresh pair of glasses for this you need mark chapter 10 verse gla- glasses you know <laughs> but it's so totally upside down logic <laughs> it's just upside down that's only cross logic jesus rules while hanging on the cross by serving the service he offers is salvation another way jesus rules while hanging on the cross is by conquering everybody say by conquering everybody say by serving by conquering so conquering what i mean is now again let me clarify i'm not particularly talking about the resurrection itself i'll make a few comments about the resurrection i'm talking about while hanging on the cross what is doing is actually conquering <laughs> conquering what conquering everything conquering sin curse death the devil i want to focus on the devil though he is conquering or defeating the devil while hanging on the cross <laughs> while hanging on the cross the devil is thinking he is defeating jesus right <laughs> the devil thinks he's got him you know he's got him good he, that's it his story is over you know he's got him and he's shaming him and you know i think i think even though i don't know of the explicit teaching but with what the bible teaches about the devil and how he tried to tempt jesus and and take him off track and all that i think on the cross more than the mockery by the romans and the jews there would have been mockery by the demons mockery by the demons you think about it the devil is an accuser the devil you know he's not a guy who lets up when we are down he really pounces on us takes full advantage you know what i mean he has no mercy and so i think when jesus was you know suffering this mockery from the romans and the jews more than that would have been mockery from the demons all the demons in hell would have mocked him so the devil i think he would have thought that's it jesus story is over you know and he is thinking here is jesus losing on the cross but actually what is happening unbeknownst to the devil the devil doesn't know it yet but, but what's happening is he is actually defeating the devil <laughs> okay now again this is scriptural teaching john 12 31 now is the judgment of this world now will the ruler of this world be cast out everybody say now now means when when he is hanging on the cross that's what it means how do i know read the next two verses 32 33 we just read it sometime back now now jesus says now what's going to happen he says the ruler of this world who's the ruler of this world devil what's going to happen to him he'll be cast out mean thrown out now when i'm hanging on the cross is when i'm going to draw people to myself and also the devil is going to be thrown out that means he's going to be removed from his position he'll no longer be the ruler of this world in one sense he will lose that hold he has he'll be thrown out yeah. the entire context here entire paragraph is about jesus is death suffering colossians 2:15 yeah. while jesus is on the cross the devil will be thrown out look at colossians 2:15 colossians 
15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in it. And that is in the cross. I know some translations will say in him, but what makes more sense probably is in the cross in light of the context. And I'll try to show you that. Always when you read in context, you get a much better and richer understanding. Colossians 2.15 says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities, put them to open shame. That is the demonic rulers and authorities, put them to open shame, triumphing over them in it, in the cross. Previous verse is talking about the cross. Let's come from verse 13 itself. At the end of verse 13, let's follow the logic of Paul here. At the end of verse 13, Paul talks about how we've been forgiven of all our trespasses or sins. So we've been forgiven. Everybody say we've been forgiven. Well, how have we been forgiven? That explanation comes in verse 14. By cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, God took the record of debt that stood against us and nailed it to the cross, Paul says, in verse 14. Some translations will say handwriting and so on. But really what it means, they say, is the record of debt. It's the same word used to describe that kadan patram, record of debt. In other words, even if you go and borrow a loan from the bank today, they give you a proper document, right? Stating you have borrowed such and such and you are obligated to pay this. And if you don't pay, these are the you know, consequences and whatnot, right? So there's a document. So in Paul's day also, there was a document. If you, uh, you know, borrowed, you had a record of that, a record of the debt you owe. And the consequences, if you don't pay and so on, it was a proper document. Paul is using that and saying, we've been forgiven. How have we been forgiven? God took the record of debt that was against us with its legal demands. You see that? That is, in other words, there was a, Paul imagines like a document, you know, that was written against us, all the sins we did and its consequences and its punishments, all that record. What did God do with that record? It seems he took it and he set it aside by nailing it to the cross. Just imagine with Paul here. Paul sees on the cross what is happening. He's given a revelation. How does God forgive our sins? Not just by saying, oh, you're forgiven, go. No, by taking that record and nailing it to the cross, meaning what? By having Jesus pay the price for our sin, be punished for our sin, face that shame and curse due to our sin. And so Paul sees that the record of death that stood against us was nailed to the cross so that now it is cancelled like how when you pay off a loan the bank cancels that or you know gives you a new proof document you know what I mean stating you owe nothing it's like that God took that old record of debt that stood against us nailed it to the cross and through it cancelled it okay that's how he forgave us now verse 15 follow the logic we are forgiven how the record of debt that stood against us was nailed to the cross cancelled our past future all our sin it's cancelled okay verse 15 he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame well, what's the connection between sin being cancelled forgiven and then the rulers and authorities being put to open shame I'll tell you what the connection is there is always a connection between the sin and the devil between sin and the without sin the devil has no hold on you without you see you have, this is an important principle. Without sin, the devil cannot do anything. He's powerless <laughs> without sin. Only sin opens the door to the devil. Only sin gives the devil a hold. You can see this in the Garden of Eden. He's t- he can only tempt Adam and Eve. He cannot actually do anything. So he, all he does is he tempt. And only when they actually fall into sin, he begins to ransack the place. He begins to come and take over, become the ruler of this world, so to speak. You know what I mean? Mess everything up. He can't mess everything up until a human sins. <laughs> Same thing he tried with Jesus. He could only tempt Jesus, but Jesus never fell into that temptation. And therefore he had no hold on Jesus. So it is sin that gives the devil a hold in people's lives. So the way God defeats the devil is by dealing with the sin problem. That is why the sin problem is more fundamental than the devil problem. Okay, On the cross, Jesus took our 
sin forgive us how by having that record of sin that stood against us nailed it on the tree nailed it on the cross forever cancelled it now sin is no longer a problem the devil cannot hold us with this sin thing anymore he loses his hold completely due to because we are ransomed as jesus put it in mark 10 he came to give his life as a ransom for many yeah, he paid the price for sins and that ransoms us from the devil's power that's the logic what's happening here specifically is 15 paul says jesus is triumphing over the demonic principalities and powers in it everybody say in it verse 15 ends with those that word those words in it everybody say in it again in what in the cross everybody say in the cross that's important for you to see it. He disarmed these demonic principalities' powers, put them to open shame by triumphing over them in the cross. Previous verses talking about cross. It makes sense for this also to be talking about cross. In light of other New Testament evidence, there is something happening on the cross where the devil is being defeated. On the cross, not just after the cross during the resurrection. On the cross. Everybody's on the cross. In the cross, right? So I'll tell you, let me explain it like this. While hanging on the cross, they stripped Jesus of his clothes and humiliated him. And I'm sure the devil and the demons were just, you know, using that to their full advantage. Humiliating him further with all their mockery thinking they've got him and that's it and everything is done. What they didn't realize is while they think he is losing and lost. What is really happening is, he is winning. The process of victory is going on. <laughs> they thought, oh, here we have humiliated him. But what is happening is Jesus is bearing the full weight of our sin, being humiliated for us, so that he can fully take care of the sin problem, so that he can have it nailed on the tree forever, so that sin doesn't ever have to be a problem for anyone if they put their trust in Jesus. The devil can never ever have a hold on them because Jesus has taken care of the sin problem. That's what's happening. It's in process. Everybody say it's in process. The process is happening. <laughs> they think he's losing. Actually, he's winning. <laughs> is he losing or is he winning? He's winning. <laughs> the victory is not yet... Nobody knows about this except God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the devil doesn't know. The devil thinks he is winning. Actually, Jesus only is winning. It's in process, so everything is not yet revealed. When is his victory going to be revealed? Resurrection. But it would be wrong for us to think that the victory comes only in the resurrection and the death symbolizes a defeat. No. If you think he lost on the cross, then one, three days later, wrong. That's not Bible teaching. That's not good theology. <laughs> he didn't lose on the cross and then win three days later. What he accomplished in his death is simply revealed in his resurrection. The victory was accomplished in his death. It is revealed, probably starting with the devil, <laughs> on the resurrection day. Yeah. What is happening? While the whole world thinks he's losing, actually he's winning. And Jesus knows it. And that's why he bears it all. <laughs> he has a different attitude to the whole thing. <laughs> Think about what I'm saying. What is happening is then, while the devil thinks he's got him and uh, Jesus is losing, while the devil is humiliating Jesus, actually according to Colossians 2.15, Jesus is in the process of humiliating the devil. That's what it says. Huh? Do you see that? Jesus is in the process of humiliating the... Doesn't it say? He put them to open shame. What is open shame? That means... They are thinking they are putting Jesus to open shame. But it is actually Jesus who is putting the devil to open shame. Yeah, it's not yet fully revealed. It's happening though. For I, people who have eyes to see, they can see it. <laughs> it is revealed to us in the word. But it's happening. Everybody say it's happening. <laughs> He's triumphing over these demonic powers in the cross. He's triumphing. Everybody say triumphing. Eh? Notice those words, right? This indicates a process. Eh? 
triumphing. Not losing, triumphing. Hebrews 2.14 says, Through death he destroyed the one who had the power of death, the devil. Eh? Through death, Hebrews 2.14. Everybody say, through death. Notice it doesn't say through resurrection. Although resurrection also, there are passages we indicate like that, you know. But there are passages like this also. What it means is, again, like I said, what he accomplished in his death, in and through his death, is revealed openly in his resurrection. Eh? Through death. Everybody say, through death. So, how does Jesus reign from the tree? How? By serving. Everybody say, by serving? By conquering. The cross turns the logic of the world upside down. Right? When it looks like he's losing, he's actually winning. Okay? When it looks like, oh, all he has is shame and humiliation, he actually has glory. If your eyes can see it. When it looks like he's dying like a common criminal. No, it's a king ruling from the tree. (laughs) Can you see it? Can you see it? (laughs) If you can. If you have seen it. If you've come into this kingdom. With this strange king. After all, the one, a king who dies on a cross must be a strange king. Right? A king who dies on a cross must be a very strange king. That's what Bonhoeffer said. (laughs) And he must be a strange king of a strange kingdom. The king himself is a little strange and the kingdom also must be strange. And if you've seen it, that means you're in his kingdom. (laughs) And if you are in his kingdom, let let me put it like this. How do we apply this truth today? If you really got what I said, Not necessarily that everybody should have gotten it, but if you got it. Like I said, this is just, it turns a worldly logic upside down, you know. While he's losing, he's winning. While he's being shamed, he's actually being glorified. The cross is actually a throne. Jesus reigns from the tree. If you got it, then you'll see everything differently. You will see everything differently. You will see the world differently. You will see yourself differently. You will see God. You will see everything differently. Because if this is how God worked on the cross, this is paradigmatic. You know, This is a paradigm. This is not some little exception out in history. If this is how God chose to work on the cross, it indicates that God chooses to work in this manner. This is the way things are in the kingdom. Let me try to boil it down. Application, okay? We should see everything differently. For example, what? Let me be specific. You should see and process and think about and deal with the high points of your life differently. High points. What I mean is glory, power. When you are elevated to uh, power or position or prestige or uh, whatever. You know, when things are going very well and you got everything and you're on top. You should think differently from people in the world and you should act differently from people in the world. Why? Because you belong to a strange king. And you are in his strange kingdom. (laughs) See, people in the world, when they come to positions of power and all that, they behave like people in the world. (laughs) They think ruling, having power, being great, is, you know, lording it over people, exercising authority, and showing that you got so much, and all that. That's how the world thinks about it, right? But we have this very different king. We belong to this very different kingdom. And therefore, we have to think according to this king, who taught us that ruling is not lording it over people. You know, your greatness is not measured by how many servants you got. Your greatness is measured by your extreme service. How you serve others. Ruling is about serving. Ruling is about serving. And so as a Christian, if God gives you positions of power, wealth and whatever, the way you need to be thinking about it is, well, it's about serving. That's why God has given me this. That's why God has kept me in this. You know, so how best can I serve? And how best can I serve the ones who are, you know, down there, downtrodden, ostracized, cast out in society. The higher you want to go in life, the lower you go and serve people. You think differently when you experience elevation in life. 
You also think differently, see differently, process differently when you experience some downturns in life, shall we say. When you experience some low points in life. You know, for example, you may be experiencing, you may be in the middle of a very painful situation, very shameful situation. You see, if you see the cross differently, you will see glory and uh, power and kingship and ruling and all that differently. You will also see pain, weakness, shame. All of it you will see differently. How? In the world, whenever there's pain, weakness, shame, they'll immediately say, oh, where is God? What is God doing, you know? Clearly, he's abandoned us. Clearly, he's cast us away. Clearly, he's messed the whole thing up, you know. That's what the world says. That's how they process it. But we have seen the cross. Don't understand the cross in light of the world. Understand the world in light of the cross. So, since we have seen the cross, we know that no, no, no. This doesn't mean God has abandoned us. Eh? We know that God is not the cause of pain, weakness or shame. But he rules and reigns even though we are going through these things. Let me ask you, if Jesus is reigning while hanging on the cross, then could Jesus not reign right in the middle of all kinds of evil? Yes, he can. And yes, he does reign. Right in the middle when we are going through life's toughest challenges when it seems like the whole world is turned against us even even if that happens always go back to the cross and remind yourself right in the middle of it he's ruling he's reigning and something is happening that I don't know you don't know something is happening God is always working behind the scenes you see the problem is these guys who are mocking Jesus they just couldn't get it because they thought there's no way God is going to use you to save the world (laughs) that's what they thought about Jesus there's no way God is going to use this despicable cross to save the world (laughs) that's what they thought that's what God was doing he was doing exactly that he was using what was despicable in the eyes of the world, despised, abased in the eyes of the world, and he was making something great out of it. You see? They were saying, there's no way, there's just absolutely no way that God could be working in and through some cross, the most shameful thing. But God was, God was doing his greatest work right in the middle of the greatest evil. These people were looking at the greatest thing God had ever done in the history of the world, ever would do, and it did not fit into the categories of their little brains. And so they missed it. Not only they missed it, they went against God. But then God used that also. (laughs) This is the glory of what's happening on the cross, you know. Which is a lesson to all of us, you know, if you're going through pain, weakness, shame, don't just look at it like people in the world. Maybe people are laughing at you. Maybe people are mocking you. Let them mock. What should you realize? You should realize that, no, no, while it looks like I'm losing, I'm actually winning. (laughs) While it looks like I'm being put to shame, actually my glory is being worked out. It's a pattern, my friend. It's always like this. That's how God works. While it looks like you're weak, you're being made strong. God turns the logic and the expectation of the world upside down or right side up. It's the way it's meant to be. This is cross logic, you understand. So if you're going through tough situations, See, how did Jesus go through it? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 gives us a clue. It says, despising the shame. On the cross, Jesus, for the joy set before him, despised the shame and endured the cross. That's what it says. Despising. Everybody said, the despising. You know what that means? Not considering it a big deal. <laughs> He's being humiliated to the max there to the ultimate extent, what is he doing? His attitude is what? 
despising it because he knows something else is happening behind the shame there is a glory being worked out it's in process behind the pain there is a pleasure being worked out it's in process there is a joy behind the you know the weakness there is a strength behind this utter look what looks like defeat there is the greatest victory being worked out it's in process everybody say it's in process <laughs> you see that's how you begin to see your own life situations <laughs> while everybody mocks you, you you despise it because you know god is doing something it's in process you cannot figure out what it is when it's in process let me tell you i preached on this there's no way i could have preached on this while jesus was hanging on the cross you know what i mean nobody knew when it was happening only god knew <laughs> only jesus knew only the holy spirit knew nobody else knew oh everybody else including paul and everybody knew only after it happened so that's how god works when it's happening you don't know what he's up to but our job is to trust him every day trust him yeah. and so you, you the attitude you should take is god you know i choose to believe you are working something behind the scenes <laughs> behind the shame there is a glory being worked out behind the pain there is a pleasure being worked out behind the shame behind the defeat there is a victory being worked out it's happening i believe you're working because that's how you did it on the cross lord while jesus was hanging you were working out the greatest victory and so i believe that's what you're doing now and so lord give me the strength just live day by day you don't worry too much you know god is working out things just ask for him the strength to live today and then tomorrow to live tomorrow and you just keep trusting him just say god i know you're working something great out and in due time pretty soon you'll see like resurrection came three days later and revealed what it was that was happening here it will become for you also you know and let the world understand on that day but you should understand now itself at least trust not self every say trust uh, when i say understand that's what i meant trust <laughs> you can't understand everything but you can trust because the cross <laughs> was really functioning as the throne from which the king was doing his greatest work he was working <laughs> working out the greatest effects of salvation while hanging on the cross let's stand up what this shows is god's ways are higher than our ways huh? my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways declares the lord let's not put god into our little brains try to understand him and his ways with our worldly logic but let us submit to the logic of the cross Thank you father. We come to you in Jesus name. You always work in unexpected ways. Upside down ways. Surprising ways. But your ways are higher than our ways. Help us to realize that if that's how you did things on the cross, surely that's how you do things today. you are the same yesterday today and forever there are reasons for why you do what you do we don't have to understand everything but what we need to do is trust so help us to trust you lord especially for those who are going through tough situations filled with pain and weakness and shame and what looks like defeat but lord help them to trust you that you are reigning right in the middle of that you are ruling you're turning things around something is happening maybe we can't see it and understand it but if we just hold on just keep trusting you it'll be revealed lord you're working so help us just keep trusting you just keep holding on and we pray for those whom you've given great position power and so on that we will act like our king our very glorious king that we will truly be kingdom citizens who behave think and behave in an entirely kingdom manner shaped by the cross help us lord to serve the downtrodden the ostracized help us to emulate your service as much as possible use us bless us we pray make us a blessing to many we give you all the glory honor and praise in jesus name we pray 
Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us for now and forevermore. Amen.